Hi, I'm Zeamless, and today is Friday, and it's time for a new how to bass tutorial. And today I'm going to show you how to make this sound. <laughs> Yay. So I was doing a 75k and it was one of virtual riot sounds and it was one of the ones that he actually told me what he did. And a big part of that particular sound was a heavy use of essentially macro control using automatic sources. Now, normally when I'd, I've done macro based things before using patch or using the environment, uh, environment controller, envelope controller, just by using X to mod whatever hell I want all together. But I've not done it a lot using, and by a lot, I mean pretty much ever, using sort of automatic processes. And by that, I refer, I'm referring to using like an envelope, which was the case in the virtual riot sound, or an LFO, which is the case in this particular sound. Everything that's moving is moving according to this guy and his speed. So before we get started with anything that's happening here, let me tell you that to use an LFO in an envelope controller, you need to have an active envelope. So in whatever whatever articulator you're in that's getting output that's outputting the motion, the envelope has to be active for the for the LFO to even do anything. Um, so what I what I just did is I just go to one of these envelopes and just kind of do one of these, and then boom. So that like it's on, it's on all the way up. It's not actually doing anything, but as long as it's there and it's on, the LFO will be active. Without it, the LFO doesn't do anything. And rather, the LFO does engage, but it ends the second the envelope is perceived to have ended. I, I guess, and if it's not on, then it just doesn't. It's it's dumb. It's really kind of a weird kind of a weird deal. But that's just what you have to do in order to make an LFO work. So do that. Um, there's a whole bunch of envelope controllers. There's really just two of the I guess two here because uh, I tried to tried to I tried to be extra complicated about what was happening here, and it didn't really work out. You can see there's a bunch of handles for things I just am not doing anything with, because I had a bunch of ideas and uh, not really all of them panned out. So this LFO is modulating this guy's X control. Now the purpose of this is that this is essentially controlling the whole speed of the whole thing, and then this X control outputs the specific position of non citrus based things which is really only one thing i was actually i was actually planning on being way more complicated with this cuz sort of to to make parity with what what you could do with something like massive serum i wanted to be able to take a, just a, a single source link it to whatever and then change the range of whatever that was which is what happens you link a source to the thing and then you change the range in here just like you would inside citrus's own internal x uh, modulation on a parameter or harbor's internal x modulation modulation on a parameter that's just sort of the the external version of that which is why i was very excited about it when it became fl12 because it didn't have that in previous versions of, of fl there were the xy controllers but you, you weren't able to really set ranges without using the uh controller linking window which was just a gigantic pain in the butt. So this is all kinds of cool. A lot of the, the sort of the specialness of the LFO moving things mostly just happens inside Citrus. Uh, so let's talk about that. Let's go to the Citrus and see what it's doing. Now, uh, be warned, I'm not entirely sure what it's doing because almost all of the decisions I made about what was happening inside Citrus, I actually made with all of this on. In fact, the very the very last one decision that I made was to have this guy on. Um, number six here is a uh, two voice, uh, two bleh, fundamental tone oc oscillator. So it means it's the same pitch as the output oscillator, which is just a sine wave. And the rest of them are four level or, 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 or different kind of thing. This guy says it's one, but it's not really one because the uh, X mod is moving the pitch of this. So when it's all the way up, it's all it's it's at fundamental tone, and then when it's down, it's not. Um, however, this is going away opposite this guy. So this means that when the LFO goes up, it's the square based version, and then when it goes down. It's the saw-based version. So in in the uh, oof. in the LFO world, we're talking about this guy. Top end is square, bottom end is saw. <laughs> of course, when I say square and I say saw, I'm talking about the harmonic series of either square or saw. Technically, the square series is still the harmonic series of the saw. It's just that it has every other harmonic. <laughs> It's kind of hard to tell, but what what is happening there is that uh, when it's on the low end, you can see there's you can see that the octave there. If it were perfectly square, you'd see that you wouldn't see the the first harmonic there because that's that's a harmonic that's not in the series of the square. 
whenever I say a solid square, I'm not literally, I do, I'm actually almost never talking about the actual shape of a solid square. I'm usually referring to the harmonic content. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of decisions that I was making with the because without, without this guy, this is what this sounded like. And that was pretty much what I was just doing the whole time. Add that in there, add that in there. And I decided I liked it. And I put an EQ in here. That's why it's clipping, and now it's not. Yay. But all that in mind, let's go look at what Citrus sounds like by itself. <laughs> That's weird. Um, I stress that I made these... <laughs> <coughs> Fuck. I stress that I made these decisions with the processing on because there's not really any reason why I would have arrived at this sound at this stage. I'm not saying that I couldn't. I'm just saying that, like, I, for just my own personal reasons, I wouldn't have thought to do this. That this sounding like this would have in any way ended up in anything that I would like. So let's talk about what's up. This is this oscillator. This is, um, I, I'm, you can see I'm altering the volume of these. I am still controlling the mod. So the difference between the volume and the mod, so we have mod here and mod here. What those two things mean? The mod up here stands for modulation input, where the mod down here stands for mod X, which is the parameter that's being modulated by the LFO that's sourcing everything's motion. Um, so that's how that LFO's position is being essentially translated into uh, Citrus's doings. Um, modulation input refers to the overall FM input of all oscillators. So we have right now the two, four, and six are the oscillators that are going into number one. So mod X, and when it's tied to the mod input, controls all the levels of these oscillators all at once. Now it doesn't actually change the literal level. If I were to output these out here, those levels wouldn't change. It only changes their level as as related to them going into operator one. Thing is though, is that I am also controlling the volume with mod X. It's just that they're going in different directions. I mean, the mod being controlled here does the tiniest bit as it's a little bit of a change, but it's almost almost negligible. I kind of just put that there just because I felt like I should have been doing something there. Um, but yes, the volume of the rest of the oscillators are the thing that, that's, that are moving. And this is because in FM, you change the intensity of FM by altering the volume of the modulating operator. These are all modulating operators, and so I'm changing its volume, which changes the amount of FM that that operator is imparting onto whatever it's linked to. Two and four are just different oscillators. I wasn't really paying attention super closely to what was going on shape-wise. I was just paying attention mostly to the pitches, which is why this guy has its uh, pitch being changed. But it's very fast. And also the motion on the LFO is very fast. So we'll show you when we, when we get to the end when everything's together. If you move it slowly, it doesn't really sound very good. And that's because the things that I'm moving are causing incredible havoc. But when, it, when they're still, they sound pretty good. Well, that was an entirely unexpected sound. I don't know what that sounds like. <laughs> Not that much different. Number two is being oscillated by number three and by number five. So number two here is the one that's being a bit different. Three, uh, four and six are just kind of independent of themselves. Um, their volume is also being modulated. Or rather, I guess number five isn't really being modulated at all, is it? By nothing. Nope. And uh, number three is having its... Huh. So a couple of these are actually modulating phase. Now, if you don't, what, if you've ever heard me talk about FM, you know that FM isn't actually FM. It's phase modulation. But I'm also, also modulating phase with the LFO. So what is that going to do? Well, if you've ever um, moved a filter around a particular frequency, notice that it changes pitch if you move it at a particular speed around it. That is what happens when you move something's phase while it's playing. So this is this phase motion. It's actually kind of screwing with the stability of the pitch a little bit for its, mo for its motion. Not a whole lot because it's not moving fast enough really for it to matter. But this does mean that the faster we move the oscillator, the, the LFO, that it actually does change the character of the modulation. Just that it's not wholly clear as to what that's literally doing in terms of like, can you hear what it's like with, with and without the phase? I just kind of did that because I knew that was, that's sort of the case. But uh, I didn't really focus too hard on what it was literally doing. Um, and again, all of these sort of leveling decisions about like where these knobs are and how, how high they are and whatever, we're all done with all the rest of the processing on. What is the rest of the processing? So first step, 
is it gets put into this. So this is actually a trick that I learned from Virtual Riot, which is just put a fill, uh, EQ that is just this shape onto something. This guy being this far down was something that I did at the very end when I just sort of noticed, noticed it sounded a bit, better, a bit better there. But really, like sort of the um, the form and shape. This is really what this, this is. The, the Usually you move it around, but actually just kind of putting it there has a big impact on stuff that you end up putting into stuff like Vokadex. So that's pretty cool. There is a peak controller at this level, and we'll, and we'll get to why it matters in a second. Uh, but like this, this is what this sounds like with that this on. You can kind of hear how like the texture and it, it, it kind of like shapes it into something that will have like the quality that we want, and then it gets distorted. This shape wasn't really anything that was like on purpose. I kind of just put lines around and moved it around until it's made sense. And by made sense, I mean it just sounded the way that I wanted it to. This is interesting. This is the guy that's actually being moved around independently. And it's loud as hell. My bad. Good old high pass. Now this is also where the after that is a fruity balance with a peak controller. And that's because when this thing sweeps down, it it creates wild and uncontrollable low frequencies that kind of just stick around after a while. And what the, the peak is doing here is that it's reading the original source level. So the level is getting screwed heavily by the distortion and the motion of the, the high pass filter. So we, I do still want to turn on and shut up when this thing turns on and shuts up. So it's coming on the peak controller. And right now it's it's decaying so fast that's actually ring modulating a little bit because the the, the peak controller is is, at, is adhering to the uh, uh, individual <laughs> motion of the actual oscillation, which is pretty easy to do when you're doing bass level stuff. Um, but it's essentially saying that the this. When it's on, it's on. When it's on, it's on. When it's off, it's off <coughs> for good. And then it goes in the Vocodex, and then it gets EQ'd, and then it gets it, it gets limited, so it stays there. But let's look at what the Vocodex is doing. So Vocodex is actually doing kind of a lot. And this window, actually, I guess I'll talk about this window first. <coughs> this is the envelope release window. Now, much like Harmer, um, pretty much every knob up here has a representative per band option. Because um, you can see when you, when you, when you play in it. Uh, I know there's a way to freeze it. Is it up here? Oh, it's up here. Derp. Uh, let's go back to it, please. So, when we look at this, we're looking at... Oh, come on. We're looking at a bunch of bands. And those individual bands, there's a hundred of them, those individual bands can have these parameters independently tweaked per them based on the graph that they're on. <coughs> so this is the envelope release thing. And then up here is what that is. Now what the release does is it's essentially how long the band sticks around after the modulator itself actually did anything. So given that the sound is modulating itself, it's not going to have a like the most tremendous effect, but it will still have somewhat of an effect. When there is motion, you can hear it kind of lag. <laughs> just the tiniest bit so what this graph is saying is that the lower and mid frequencies actually um are re are releasing faster than the higher frequencies so this creates a kind of a cascading uh change in release time on per the band which gives us a little bit of this weird little sheen to it <laughs> It's real subtle, but if you move it around with it, you can hear it pretty okay. This effect is much more pronounced when you're doing something with a, like an actual modulator that isn't the original sound, because Vocodex's motion is entirely determined by the modulator. Like what level comes out is entirely determined by the modulator, which is why these particular param the parameters that change how the bands behave are very important, which is, you know, all of them, all the parameters, they all do that. It's worth noting that this particular ability exists for the other time parameters as well. Attack and hold can be changed per band. Uh, so on the gain, you can see I'm cutting off quite, quite a bit of the low frequencies. And I actually, I have the wet all the way up, but I do have some of the low pass uh, original coming in. That's getting in there to fill out kind of the low end with the high end being the Vocodex. Good 
times. Um, and now, much like, much like uh, the level of release window, I'm also changing the bandwidth per band. <laughs> When I do stuff like this, I usually create a shape like this, and then I, I turn on slide uh, notes, or slide points, rather. I just kind of move it around. And you can see what's happening when I'm doing this. The the higher values mean that there's more bandwidth, and the lower values mean there's less bandwidth. So that when, so like the overlapping kind of really... Kind of like that a little lower bit there. This and, uh, and as there's not really it's not really a coincidence that I'm using this particular shape. This actually creates a little bit of the formative motion, even if we're already doing a lot of things that's, that's sort of accentuating the formative quality. Doing this is a lot like doing what we did with this uh, EQ over here, where because we accentuate the differences with, on those particular locations, it's not as if it's really EQing those positions, but the sharper or darker areas in those in, in those areas being different at that shape creates the sound creates the feel of it and it's in its own very peculiar way uh and then the modulator pitch shift same deal All kinds of good stuff there. And I changed the band distribution to be perfect as opposed to its default. By default, it does this. And what this is essentially saying is that uh, even though there are frequencies this low, it's actually it's all being stretched to fit in this frequency range. It's a little bit hard to tell looking at this graph what's, what's happening here. You're given a reading, uh, a, 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 essentially a level <laughs> reading of the bands that are present. And uh, it's different than what the graph you're used to looking at, but the frequency range is actually vertical. And this line determines where those frequencies live, like how much it gets distributed per those frequencies. So when we do it like this, this is essentially saying that everything is normal. If it shows up at 100 hertz, it's going to be in 100 hertz. But, like, let's see, where is actual 100 hertz? Like, right here. So if I moved it up here, a range that would have been 20 to 20, 20 to 20k, that whole range gets accordioned to fit into 100 to 20k. And this is just the bands, remind you. This isn't some like hyper advanced like frequency shifting. This is just moving the the bands around, which is like what the pitch of the bandwidth is doing. It's just a different way of doing that. But this this is actually like this by default, so that um, the low end you're not vocoding sub frequencies, which is like super muddy and not really all that valuable. I mean, I'm cutting off most of them anyway, so it doesn't particularly matter. Normally, when I'm using a 100 band, I'll do something like this which actually makes it so that there's actually less bands on the lower end and a lot of bands on the high end. So it actually distributes it a bit more normally uh, frequency-wise. But uh, I did actually keep it around like this, um, which is actually another kind of thing I took from Virtual Riot, which was that uh, in some of the sounds that he did, that I actually like, was just like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm really losing this. I don't get how the texture was made. And it's because he actually would just use just straight-up regular broken X's and not do any of the shit that I just did. He would have 100 bands, and he would just change these parameters, and that'd be the end of it. All the magic that he was doing is happening elsewhere. And which is not to say that one way is better than the other. It just kind of means that you're sort of distributing your work either. Because like, you can do you can do a lot in Vocodex to fix the sound, but you can also do a lot to fix the sound by fixing the sound before you go to Vocodex. So it's sort of, it sort of, it belies where, belies, is that really what that word means? Uh, it sort of betrays where uh, VR versus me likes to put our work in sound design. And then the EQ and then the limiter. <laughs> Pretty basic stuff. So the LFO is controlling. Like I'll, I'll show you what I mean when I move slow. Like if I actually move it like regular, like not the skewed. So that's why that's why the tension is pretty is pretty uh, flat in the top like that. Lots of neat stuff. 
sound like this is a lot of fun because when you mess around with any of the parameters, they change pretty heavily. Like just the addition of this guy meant quite a bit of difference earlier. <laughs> And like screwing around with levels and amounts and, and all that kind of stuff will have a big impact. And also just like this, like moving around where these things are has a huge impact. And then of course, moving around. Uh, that you saw even the, the biggest impact on some of the ones that happened here. You could probably make an entire like bro steppy song out of just this patch just by cloning it a hundred times and doing varying varying levels, like varying variations on levels and stuff. And just play higher or lower notes of those, and it would sound like totally different sounds, because they would be for not a lot of work all up, honestly. So if you did want to like automate this from here without using the LFO, which you could do, just turn the LFO off, turn on uh the modulars and the X mapping, and then move this guy around and now you got regular sort of control. <laughs> Just remember that it favors fast motion in the middle bits. Or well, obviously, you could also uh, approximate that yourself by anger, engaging, engaging, engaging a double curve. Makes that you not know, so you don't necessarily have to uh, manually move it around fast. But I personally prefer just doing one to one and doing that kind of stuff in the automation clips later. So there's that. Let's put you back to normal. We. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this patcher preset will be available in the description of this video for downloading. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all of that good stuff. And I don't have a camera today because it's pointing at... Uh, it's, what is it pointing at? It's pointing at the um, modular stuff. And I don't really want to move its setup because it's kind of hard to get in that position. And it's what it's doing for the current track from scratch, which I guess you guys who are on YouTube have even seen yet because the, la the latest videos for uh, the track from scratch haven't actually come out yet. But when they do, and then you see the next track from scratch, you'll understand. Uh, yeah. So, as usual, have a nice day. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> Bye.